The mobile unit is a place of... The mobile unit is a place that... Oh, what am I trying to say? The mobile unit is a vessel of celebration, communication, and community. The mobile unit is a place that opens the door to theater and is a place of joy. The mobile unit is a unique experience that hopefully brings joy, laughter, and excitement to the people. The mobile unit is a place of celebration, communication. A ton of fun. The mobile unit is a ton of fun. And I'm super excited about Comedy of Errors this year. As we do that, it is a bilingual production of A Comedy of Errors. So please come and see it in your neighborhood. There's not even an excuse to not come and see it. It doesn't cost you a dime. It just costs you your time. So come on out and see that. In 1957, Joseph Papp began mobile theater. Papp's original touring company evolved into the New York Shakespeare Festival, ultimately becoming the public theater we all know and love. Years later, Joe Papp's original idea was given a facelift, and the public theater's mobile unit was born. Hey everybody, it's Garlia here at The Public. The Public Theater is... Your work. (laughs) Hello and welcome to Public Square 2.0. My name is Garlia Cornelia Jones, the Director of Innovation and New Media at The Public Theater. This week, we're going to take a moment to talk about one of the public theater's most exciting programs, the mobile unit. A reinvention of Joe Papp's mobile theater, the summer of 23 marks a return to the more traditional mobile unit programming. The past few years have been difficult for all live and performing arts, but perhaps no other department at the public was more uniquely affected by the pandemic than the mobile unit. Now, the mobile unit prepares for a long anticipated return to normalcy with an exciting new production of Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors. But before we talk about where we're going, let's take a minute to talk about where we've been. Barry Edelstein was a key player in reviving the mobile unit in 2010, after the program's 30-year hiatus. All of it was built on a simple idea. Culture belongs to everyone. So what exactly does the mobile unit do? Mobile Unit, for me, is all about, and the legacy of Mobile Unit, is all about deconstructing the barriers of access to theater and to a theatrical experience. It's about taking away the money so we show up with free, free everything. It's about taking away the construct in which we created around the experience and bringing it to you and saying, this is for you too. You may not have thought that it was, but it is for you as well. And so doing that work to deconstruct that is what makes the mobile unit what it is. And that is what I feel like will sustain in the legacy 20 years from now. That was Precious Wilson Gay, Interim Director of the Mobile Unit. We'll hear more from her later. During the summer of 2022, Freedom Bradley Ballantyne came back to the public as our Director of Artistic Programs and an Associate Artistic Director. You might recognize his voice from an earlier episode this season on our production, The Harder They Come. When you 
think about, I think even, because you're speaking about sort of theater in a time when I, th- I think the theater has changed and, have, and have evolved a, a bit over the last I don't know, 20 years. Mm-hmm. And so as mm-hmm. we think about wh- wh- where we're go- go- where we are going, right? We've we've had a tremendously ch- challenging last couple of mm-hmm. year, year, year years for our our, our institutions and <laughs> and even ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. And so as as you thinking about as 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 you think about where both the industry and and the the public like well, what are you thinking about for the f- f- future you know the more the more things change the more they remain the same mm. and and i think some of the brilliance of what oscar and what you all have done you know like over it, during these last you know Almost twenty years, I, I'd imagine. You know, like is is really going back into the publicness of mm. the public theater, mm. and and making sure that you know, like something like the mobile unit yes. was brought back. Uh, that something like and it was expanded on with something like public works. Mm-hmm. So I think that part of it is what is the next step for these sorts of programs? Right. Because if you look at the uh, if you look at mobile unit, that's a traditional outreach program. Right. And it's a and its model is based in the 60s and it's all about, you know, going in and taking a piece of work and taking it to communities. Next thing you had was public works was okay, we're going to take this piece into a community, but we're really going to engage the community in the making of this piece mm-hmm. so that, you know, it's not just them witnessing the piece. It's them actually performing in the piece. Mm-hmm. I think that the next phase of this is going to be, all right, what are the stories that the community itself wants to tell? Mm. And creating those stories and giving them the – and supporting them with the tools to make those stories happen mm-hmm. so that we're telling stories that are ne- that are from the community, by the community, in the community, as well as at the public theater. I think that that's another phase uh, that we can go to go deeper into this. Uh, the work that we've done, uh, that I've done in in prior places with corrections, mm-hmm. I think that that's a big place that mm-hmm. we want to go at yeah. the public theaters. How are we engaging people that can't get to the yes. space? Yes. You know, we have a we have a we have a way now that we we provide tickets to people to come to the, see the show. Right. We take shows out to communities so right. that they can see it. But what are we doing then for places that can't have they access, can't that are denied access? Right. For whatever reason, right. you know, and I think that that's the next phase of the work that we're going to be doing. And that's the next phase of Joe Papp's original vision of making a theater that's for the public, no matter where they are. Mm. Uh, another big, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, and we might talk about this a little bit more, but uh, about the next, the challenges are f- that are facing theater right now. And I think one of the biggest challenges is, uh, is a lack of trust, mm, yes. you know, and, and, yeah. and there used to be this thing, you know, like the show must go on, mm-hmm. you know, like w- we've mm-hmm. broken that trust or, yeah. or situations have broken that trust. Yeah. You know, COVID has broken that mm-hmm. trust. Uh, uh, the, you know, tickets have, you know, the cost of tickets, that's yeah. all of these things have broken that trust. Yeah. And we, we have to get back to the show must go on because I think that that's something that's really hurting our field right. uh, and hurting the the really the revitalization of theater as we move right. forward. And you, and thinking about the show must go on as in we need to find ways to reduce t- ticket prices for community community to have a, have access we need to find ways to continue doing our work but make it more accessible to to p- people is that that's a little- part of it mm-hmm. but i mean just you know there are a lot of costs that have gone up mm-hmm. in in theater you mm-hmm. know like we've all taken on uh, we've all taken on I, in, 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 at the public, at least, we have a cultural transformation yeah. that is occurring, right. you know, that necessary, Absolutely. needed, you know. And I think that all of, you know, theaters are grappling with that. How mm-hmm. are we making a more equitable mm-hmm. workspace? Right. Now, 
that doesn't just happen. No. You know, that's <laughs> it, it takes people to plan that out yes, it and it costs <laughs> and it has real resources mm-hmm. that need to go behind that's that. Right. You know, so how are we now going to make sure that we are having a more equitable workspace so that we're not driving people the same way that we were driving people and that we have more um, more resources for them. Mm-hmm. Part of that, how that's showing up, is making sure that we have more uh, understudies, mm-hmm. you know, making sure that we have more coverage for people that are, you know, working behind, behind the scenes. Yeah. So when, we, when we're talking about, you know, making theater the show must go on. We're talking about putting resources like that into mm-hmm. spaces so that the show will uh, will happen. My name is Precious Wilson Gay. I am the interim director of Mobile Unit at the Public Theater, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. One of the things that is special is that we're returning back to our traditional model. Mm-hmm. We're coming with straight Shakespeare. Um, Summer of Joy, as you know, was parts of Shakespeare's text, and it invited the crowd to really um, inform what was going to happen on stage. We're going back to kind of our straight Shakespeare play. The addition of Spanish language in the piece is something that is very, very special, Um, as well as we have this amazing composer, Julian Mesri, who has been working with our director, Rebecca Martinez, to craft these beautiful songs um, that that point out, that give life to the characters of commutative errors that you don't see in the traditional script. There are some icky things that happen in all Shakespeare shows, but the way that Rebecca and Julian have taken those moments and give give them a new and have get, given them a new breath has been so special. Um, and I just cannot wait to see it out on the road. Rebecca Martinez and Julian Messery and I had the opportunity to sit down at the beginning of April. You'll notice a background shift as I was in Michigan visiting family for the holidays. Shout out to my dad for his library wall of books, many on Shakespeare. I definitely needed to pull out a few for some prep. <laughs> I love how worlds collide, and my conversation with Rebecca and Julian was one where we discovered all the collisions our professional lives have encountered over the last decade or so, and how beautiful it was to be reunited in this way with their very special adaptation of Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors. The thing right now... um that is so beautiful about the mobile unit and about this opportunity is that I have, we have agency. We have agency to make the piece that we want to make, to make it in a way that feels right for us. And to, and now that we have, we're in rehearsals and we have a group of folks and we've had several development um, opportunities, but to like build it with members in our community, communities, And to just continue to think about if we're doing this and we're bringing this out into communities, what are the things, how do we want to show up? How do we want to represent ourselves? And how do we want to invite people in? And that feels like um, such a critical and important part. Yeah, I I just said a lot of things. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) What is the value of doing this work at a predominantly white institution that's focusing on Latin stories? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing to talk about in terms of theater community is, you know, I grew up, um, you know, I was born in Argentina, but I came to the U.S. when I was four. And, you know, my mom, Susanna Cook, you know, she's a downtown theater stalwart. And I remember being like a kid, like eight, nine years old, and like being in my mom's shows and then <clears throat> going to her in rehearsals. And um, and just getting to know a theater that was extremely accessible, that was very open to communities in a lot of ways, you know, Wow Cafe, Dixon Place, like these, you know, places where the the sort of the route towards, you know, I get together with my friends, we rehearse something, we put something on stage, we find a community is not as as large, right? I feel like the bigger the institutions become, the harder it is to sort of bridge that gap. And 
what I then realized as I was getting older is that, you know, and I, and I got to connect more with theater in, in Buenos Aires is that that is very much the form of like what we might call like Teatro Independiente, independent theater in Buenos Aires, where, where the, mm -hmm. the institutions themselves are pretty small. I mean, the theaters are, are just simply venues that play things in rep and then people come and, and find their way to make a show and then put it on stage. And then, you know, and then as we get to these, you know, PWIs, um, what I notice isn't just sort of the, the, the whiteness of these institutions, let's say, but also mm. the, the, the massiveness of them in terms of money, mm. in terms of budgets, in terms of, yeah. you know, and, and at the same time that like, it's amazing because it allows you these incredible resources and it allows you productions that are much larger and it allows, uh, you know, ideally people to be compensated in ways that they otherwise wouldn't. It also, uh, makes those those the, the it bridges you know it becomes harder to figure out how to bridge those gaps how to reach out to those communities yes. um and mm -hmm. something like mobile unit which is removes the economic barrier but then also removes the the the, the place barrier right like it, it, you know what lets someone know that like this place that they have access to right what lets someone know that this large theater where most of the time they see people showing up in like you know looking very fancy people who are not in their community going to that place what lets them know that that's also a place that they're also welcome to right um right. and so Absolutely. you know and yes you can see a show in the theater itself um, but then you can also see a show in a park and you can connect to it. And, and then you take something like Shakespeare, which again, uh, has all these sort of institutionalized elements to just Shakespeare, right? Shakespeare, you know, himself is like an institution. It allows us to say, no, no, we have access to that. Right. And I think that the question yeah. of access and the question of who gets to, you know, have this this culture right who gets to say what they want to do with this culture that should belong to all of us same with history same with city right mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i think it's a very important question to open and that's part of the reason and i think it's also so important to show that it is a bilingual conversation you know um mm -hmm. you know we don't we are not a city that works in one language we are a city that works not just in two yeah. we, we're in so many languages right um Right. And for us to create work that really bridges out to these communities and that really reflects the world that we're in instead of just one very small subset of that world, we have to start diving into new languages. We have to, we have to reflect a little bit more accurately in some ways the world that we all already experience. Here's more from my conversation with Freedom. I, I know that community is a really big thing mm -hmm. for you and it's something yes. that you know anyone that has spoken about you th that I have have known that's sort of this feeling is that you are a person that brings people to together you're a person that helps p p people out um, and so I would just love for you to share a little bit more about what com community means to you and what it is that that drive, drive, drives you to support community yeah. so d deeply. Well, I mean, I can, that's such a that's such a a long question. I mean, uh, like in in terms of how I view it, it's yeah. it's 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 more philosophical, and I I kind of back into it in a different way yeah. of what of of through my work mm -hmm. uh, and and how I've decided to uh, structure my life mm -hmm. and my my life is really structured around service mm -hmm. uh, service to humanity mm -hmm. so and and that happens to be working in theater and mm -hmm. I utilize theater as a way to be in mm -hmm. service so in com with theater it's especially 501c3s right. you know when you look at those as not for profits 501c3s yeah. are not for profits and and not for profits are, are were originally constructed to service the public good. Mm -hmm. So that means all of us. Mm -hmm. Now in New York it's going to look a little bit different than what it would look like in San Diego. Right. But or if you're with a national organization it looks different than what it is for a local yeah. organization. But it's the key is to identify who you think the community is mm -hmm. in which you're working in. 
at the public theater, which is, you know, a huge, large, not-for-profit theater, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the founding of that was really built upon access. Uh, and it was built by Joe Papp. And it was built by, you know, imagining that we would use parks as a place to gather and, and share Shakespeare's work. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when it moved from that area, it moved into moving to neighborhoods throughout New York City. So the public theater has always been built on providing access to the arts for all of New York City. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not just interested in creating access in terms of, you know, we want, we're interested in doing a show. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a little bit deeper than that. Right. It's a little bit more than that. Right. It's around, you know, providing access to make an impact in your community and mm. using theater. Mm -hmm. So how do I look at theater? I look at theater as being a place where we get together and share our humanity, share our culture, mm. share our stories, and a way that we can learn more about one another to bring us all together mm. uh, as a community. Precious Wilson Gay is the interim director for the mobile unit. Working from an anti-racist lens, she specializes in working with communities to amplify the stories that matter to them. Like all of us, her current work as an artist has been influenced by her journey. She and I had a moment to sit down earlier and talk about her work, her life, and her vision for the mobile unit. First, I want to start start with your journey to within the within the pub, a public. I have no, known you to be in a couple different departments mm -hmm. over my couple or several year, year years. So, would you take us for the people who don't know you through that journey? Yeah, definitely. So, I started um, the public theater in twenty eight. I believe is the year. Um, I actually started in the marketing department. I was a um, grad school resident um, with Brooklyn College. And right at that point, there was a residency between Brooklyn College and the public theater, um, with, specifically with the marketing department. Um, I helped to curate borough distributions, which is the initiative um, attached to Shakespeare in the Park, where we give out free tickets um, in the different boroughs uh, for the show that's happening uh, at the Delacorte later that evening. Um, and that is that was my first kind of um, introduction into what community work could look like at the public theater. Um, soon thereafter, the summer was over, there was a um, job description um, put up by the mobile unit department. And I had a couple of folks in the marketing department <laughs> who were like, like poking at me like, hey, I really think that you should apply to this. It sounds like something that you would enjoy based off of what you've told us about your aspirations. Um, and I applied and I got it. <laughs> um, and so I then transferred into the mobile unit department as a community coordinator. Um, and I served in that role for a couple of years um, under the leadership of Karen Ann Daniels at that mm -hmm. time, um, who is an amazing black amazing. woman, amazing. fierce theater maker. Karen Ann. Love her. <laughs> um, and, and that was great, but that was my first introduction into, like, working with mobile units communities, which are very specific. Um, and from there, I helped to pilot the mobile unit and corrections program. Mm -hmm. um, and I also am a boss, fierce <laughs> black woman theater maker. And yeah. so I was like, I'm managing now. Yeah. <laughs> I should be a manager. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was able to get a promotion to be <laughs> the community <laughs> programs manager. Um uh, and then there was, you know, the pandemic happened and right. everything shut down right. and a whole lot of things kind of transpired. I did get furloughed um, during that time at the public yeah. theater. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I don't remember the time of that view, so that yeah. was... <laughs> It was like five months. It was very, yeah. It was pretty short because then we did Summer of Joy in the summer of 2021. Yes. <laughs> By now, you might be sitting around thinking, wait a minute, what is the summer of joy everyone keeps talking about? During 2021, while all of us were trying to figure out how to keep producing amidst new COVID waves and variants, the mobile unit decided to do something innovative. 
Mobile Units Summer of Joy was a pop-up experience in New York's open spaces with three key community and performance elements. Each day began with the National Black Theater's Stage for Healing and Resilience, co-produced by the Public Theater and National Black Theater in continuation of a relationship that dates back to the 1960s. Oh, the mobile unit special. Um, so the mobile unit brings free, accessible programming to all five boroughs in New York City. One of our main tenets of our program is our Shakespeare tour mm-hmm. um, that we do at least once a year. Mm. Um, and we bring that tour around all five boroughs to community centers, correctional facilities, homeless shelters, um, recreation centers. Mm. We've actually expanded in the last couple of years due to the pandemic to now perform outdoors. Mm. in plazas Mm -hmm. and on open streets, um, which has also been, you know, a (laughs) beautiful journey. (laughs) Yeah, you were. Garlia was there to help pilot the first uh, outdoor (laughs) tour for mobile. Um, But yeah, we bring bring theater to the people. Mm -hmm. Um, We've had some other partnerships where we've done with Joe's Pub, Mm -hmm. where we've brought an artist to, um, a musical artist to our different partners as well. But the base of it is bringing the theater, bringing the art to you so Mm -hmm. that you don't feel the need to come to us Mm -hmm. and meeting you where you are. I love that. And I, and I will say the, my first, I've had two interactions with mobile the first was Mobile National yes. with the tour of Sweat. Yes. And I, that was the fall of 2018. I received a key, key, key chain, which is also a b- bottle opener, which is still on my keys today. So thank you, <laughs> Mobile Unit, for have, always having great Sweat swag. And then, um, and, and then being part of Mobile. S- so summer of joy, where we were outdoors in the heat mm-hmm. with, with our pink tees yep. <laughs> that we, you know, we would c- cut off our sleeves mm-hmm. to look cute. But just, um, and and we also partnered with NBT, the National Black yes. Black the- the- Theater, for that as as well, which was a really ex- exciting. Um, a p- partnership because mm-hmm. because we were out of new doors, there was space for fa- families mm-hmm. even to have bubbles and people could write their re- reactions mm-hmm. to the work. Yeah. I fell in love with theater when I was a child. Mm. I remember being 10 and my mother taking me to a tour stop on The Lion King. And I just remember <laughs> that opening moment where the puppets come down the aisles and I was like, what is this? I want in. Um, (laughs) But I also went to a performing arts elementary school, and I had been on the stage, and I did not like it. Mm. Um, And I knew I didn't like being on the stage. I'm someone who gets, like, very nervous when I do public speaking and all of the things. And so my mother, after (laughs) going to that performance, I was like, Mommy, what is this thing? I want to do it. Um, And just through, like, exploration, I... um, I came to stage management because it allowed me to be in the room. And something Mm. that I love about theater is the rehearsal process. Like, that's Mm. my favorite part of theater. The performances are great. But, like, to see something that comes from this script that is, Mm. it's definitely, uh, scripts are dynamic, but also it's just words. Mm -hmm. And see it come alive, it's just like, it's what makes it worthwhile for me. Um, And so I knew a stage manager was in the room. And they also really handle the show in Mm. the room and the environment. And I wanted to be a part of that. Now, (laughs) my freshman year of college, first (laughs) semester, I decided it was not for me. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I, I, The long hours, Mm. and I just learned so much about it. And I was like, I don't think I want to be in Excels for the rest of my life. (laughs) (laughs) It was just like not something that I was super interested in. And so I was like, okay, so what else can I do? That is still within this, still within this world, yeah. but not necessarily stage management. And so I moved into production management, mm-hmm. and I enjoyed that as well. But I also was like, oh, I get really nervous around power tools and having conversations with people, mm-hmm. and there was just things that happened in produ- in my journey in production management that had me be like, I think I could do this for a short while, but mm-hmm. I don't want to do it for the rest of my life. Right, right. Um, right. and. 
which is the like I said, the beauty of theater because I was able to bring in all of those things. Um, mm-hmm. And that kind of pivoted me into pursuing an arts management degree mm-hmm. um, and learning more about um, the systems that have been set up for us to to do this work. Um, and from there, I just kind of like blossomed. I, you know, thought I wanted to be a marketer. And then I was like, I don't want to work in marketing. That's not my calling either. <laughs> um, so what is it? And yeah. um, something that has always been kind of at the base of who I am as a person is community organizing. Mm-hmm. I started community organizing when I was 10 years old. And okay. so I have over 15 years of um, experience in community yeah. organizing. And I saw the importance of doing art in the community, intentionally in the community. Right. Yeah, so I had been community organizing for over 15 years. Um, I started when I was 10 years old. And the beautiful thing about Mobile Unit was it was an opportunity for me to make that art in community yes. once again. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it, it really was this like ebb and flow. And I just did things for as long as I liked them. And then I, when I didn't like them anymore, I was like, well, what else can I do with I theater? But it was always theater. And yeah. it's always been theater. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. And I mean... I will say m- marketing is such a u- 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 useful tool and mm-hmm. something that we should should all really know how to do and and so I th- I think it's great that that you you know came in through through a whole di- a whole di- different di- di- department mm-hmm. which also gave you an idea of how that department interacts with mm-hmm. the other parts of the institution. Yes. So when you were in the different part of the institution, you've got some insight, which I think only only helps the, the success of the work that, that you do. Because you come in as a thought partner with the marketing department and be like, oh, I know how this works. Let's think about it this way, which, which I think, you know, is something that the department just is likely, oh, great, okay, grateful for us was as well, well, yes, yeah, super helpful. So you've you've mentioned a couple times the community commun- community work that that you've done, um, and that term is meaningful to me. And I, I'm not sure it's something people would think of immediately with within theater. It's it's. Uh, s- so that's certainly also a, a way I have shaped sort of my, my career and thinking about th- ab- about the way that we share our work with with people. Mm-hmm. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about that? What what does community work lo- uh, look like to you in outside of an institution l- l- like the a pub a public and in theater as an industry overall? Ooh, heavy <laughs> question. <laughs> um, so. You know, I came specifically into the mobile unit with established partnerships. Mm. The mobile unit mm. has been active for over t- for 12 years. We're in our 12th year. Um, and so I came in with, you know, eight years locked down. I might have my numbers wrong. I'm a theater person, not a mathematician. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that really helped for me to kind of move forward in, in doing the work because there was already a built trust Mm. in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's key to any community relationship is trust between the two partners. If the partner does not trust you, your program ultimately will not be successful. Um, And so thank thank you for all of the folk that did that work (laughs) beforehand. Mm -hmm. Um, But for me, the thing that is interesting is how do you build mutually beneficial relationships? And this is something, a a term that... um, Karen Ann used so beautifully during my time about what it actually means to be in a mutually beneficial relationship with a partner, mm-hmm. which is something um, to be to that is that it that calls mutually beneficial relationships call for continuous conversation mm. with your partner. Right. Um, and that's really what I do. I'm constantly mm-hmm. in conversation with our partners, whether it it's, hey, do you want to come see this show? Or hey, mm-hmm. I heard this thing, this protest happened on your steps on Mm -hmm. Sunday, Mm -hmm. like at the LGBT center this past Sunday. Are you good? What happened? Do you need any support? Is there anything we can do? Mm -hmm. There's also a constant resource exchange of, hey, there's this petition we'd like for you to sign. Hi, there's this event we would like to do. Um, And so specifically for the mobile unit, it's really about maintaining those relationships and then being able to have this product of offering Mm -hmm. the shows. Um, Another... Thing that feeds into that is 
this idea that when we are creating our work, we're creating our work with community in mind. Mm. So we're not creating our work for the traditional theater goer who goes right. to see every Broadway show. Right. That's an, actually not an audience. Our right. audience is the folks who are going to walk right. past and be like, what is this weird thing? And Shakespeare? What is that? Yeah. I'm going to sit down yeah. for five minutes yeah. and see if I'm interested. Yeah. And usually, you know, not all the time, some people brush us off, but for the most part, folks would be like, I I'm going to stay because it's exciting or it's yeah. funny or all the things that mobile yeah. unit is. Um, and so, you know, it's about being in conversation and being able to deliver something that feels um, intentional mm -hmm. to the partner. For the large, larger theater industry, I don't know if I really have an answer to that one because mm -hmm. I think that community, I don't want to use the word weaponized because I don't think that's the word for it, but it's like a token term. When theater companies go, oh, we work in the community. What does that mean? What does that mean? What what community? Right. Who are you impacting? How are you measuring your impact? Right. You know, it's and then and then you right. have to take into the account of are you causing any harm right. when you're doing this community work? Right. Um, and so it, it's it's hard to answer that question because I haven't seen many successful models mm. of what it is to do work with theater in community um, and also relationships that last. I think that's another thing. Yeah. Folks will work with community for a season mm -hmm. because they got a grant to do this project with this artist and the artist wants to do this work in the community and take their stories and build these beautiful you know, projects, which is all important. Right. But then what do you do with the community that you impacted after right. once it's over, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, is it, is it this? You is it this one time, one time moment where you? Is it is it this moment where you just interact with them one right. time and it's over, or is there a conversation? And I really lo 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 love the way that you have framed it as this conversation. Mm -hmm. Again, shout out to Karen Ann and the, and the way that she just, I mean, I, I remember being in meetings with her and mm -hmm. that was something, and not even meetings, just conversation mm -hmm. with her as a human, yes. right? That is just part of the ethos that is Karen Ann of Daniels. And we're going to cite how many times we yes, say her exactly. in this episode. Because, <laughs> I'm going to call her after and be like, I called you out the whole time. <laughs> yeah, she is, she is worth all the call outs. Yes. Okay, wait a minute. Who is this Karen Ann person? Before joining the Folger Shakespeare Library as the Director of Programming and Artistic Director of Folger Theater in 2021, Karen Ann of Daniels was the Director of the Mobile Unit at the Public Theater from 2019 to 2021, touring mobile unit productions across all five boroughs in New York and launching new programs such as Mobile Unit and Corrections, which brings the tools of theater into the lives of incarcerated communities. She is a 2021 Fellow at the Atlantic Fellows on Racial Equity, a network of leaders from the U.S. and South Africa working to deepen their personal leadership and build expansive new futures in which Black people and people of color are seen, valued, and respected. And not only is she a dear friend, but she is a valued artist and mentor to so many. I think that what was kind of incredible about that, though, was that we were given the space and the time to work. And, and when people are given space and time to work and feel like they have a home, uh, you make things and you you're able yes. to to think about things and it's and it's and it's there's a beauty in that there's a beauty in just simply you know my philosophy is yeah like give people some space and a couple of ideas and they're gonna come up with stuff if, if you mm -hmm. know because that's sort of how our creative engines work and yeah you know the the fact that the the institution was willing to say we trust you enough to just give you these few days uh mm. and then give you more days and more days to just mm -hmm. create and then show us what you've made i think that's something really powerful and here's more from my conversation with rebecca and julian it yeah. it's the kind of thing that made 
made us feel like by the time we we are going into rehearsals now i feel like we're already in in our in an artistic home um mm. and and we're able to bring that energy to to mm -hmm. our cast we're able to bring that energy mm -hmm. to a bunch of and you think about our cast too it's like it's, i think we have you know we've worked or or you know i mean some of the people in our cast like i worked with at intar from when i was first doing sound design shows and now they've done like broadway and they've done you know they've all yeah. been through these careers um, and it's an really amazing, wonderful yes, to find us or at the Lark, you know, so many of these mm -hmm. actors, I remember from the U S Mexico exchange, RIP, that program was so great. Um, and again, it's like, there's a way in which yeah. that creates such a different environment. And at the same time, there's actors who maybe I just worked for the time, first time last year on the Fornes piece that again, Fornes, that piece was premiered at Intar, like, 40 years ago and the only document for it was like this thing I had to go at Lincoln Center and watch and figure out okay how did they do this musical in Intar in like you know and so it's a lot of that it's yeah. a lot of um it's a very exciting uh sort of process to just see how all that comes to fruition how all that's connected one of the things that I I I have always been like like I've been watching the public for a minute for you know there's a lot of reasons to watch the public yeah, yeah, but the yeah. thing that I I was was like keeping an eye on is the Latina power team mm. and um how like with Maria Goyanes with Stephanie Ibarra with Roxana Barrios with uh Nidia Medina with Jacob Padron Jacob, uh, well, he's not Latina, but <laughs> he's Latino. But Latin. he's a, oh, I thought you said Latino. But, but, Sorry. <laughs> but there was a very specific and 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 Lori Woolery and yeah. like looking very specifically at this group. And there's there's you know there's other folks as well as as like ah there is an in there mm -hmm. is within this larger there's, institution of storytelling right. there are there are advocates mm -hmm. that I know I can align with and feel and, and connect with. And it ended up being uh, Stephanie Ibarra who gave me um, a seed commission, like, I don't know, 2018, a long time ago <laughs> as a director for the yeah. mobile unit. Yeah. And then, you know, we had a lot of transitions and with, with the mobile unit itself and pandemic and, and all sorts of things. Yeah. But it was like, it was that initial commission that got mm -hmm. me to, to think and examine. And I followed the mobile unit around and I was thinking about yeah. the type of work and how things were received and uh, in, interviewed a bunch of actors, interviewed some partners mm -hmm. and just did a really sort of like in-depth look at it which was which was just wildly helpful in mm. the thinking and planning of this and then when Roxana was like hey do you want to make a thing I was like yes let's make a thing and yeah. she said it was very important that it that it also have Spanish and I'm like yes I am down yeah and can it have music and she said yes and I said okay I need Julian <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I love for you to, this is, this is an excellent pivot too. And, you know, it, it, just from what you shared a little bit, Julian, it it's, uh, sounds as if this piece had quite a bit of reinvention over time. And, and as we think about Shakespeare being an actor who also had to reinvent in, in, himself, how do you go about reinventing and of ad ad adapting a comedy of of errors into this this adaptation? And, and I would love for you to really share th that with, with us. I can start a little, Julian. And yeah, can, please. <laughs> You know, one of the, the initial things that was making me think of is particularly when we were talking about the tour being potentially outside. Mm. And this is when there were such big questions. This was like in the fall of 2021 it, and, and just how things have shifted and grown. Um, it became, I, I started to think about street theater in Latin America. Mm. And I started so, to think yeah. about like, what are the ways to invite people in? And what are the ways to, if you're walking along the street, and you hear a thing and you get pulled in halfway through how to engage this person and bring them in, even if right. they're there for a minute or even if they're like, hey, I've got 20 minutes and I'm going to stay. Or even if it's like I've been here from the beginning. So that was a huge thing of, of 
And that's where music became such, mm -hmm. such an important part uh, about that idea of invitation and wanting to very clearly, and also tone, like tone setting is really important. Yeah. And I really wanted it to be a comedy. I really wanted it to, to, to be joyful and celebratory. But at the end, like comedy of errors is about family separation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's about families who are separated across a border because an arbitrary border because of arbitrary laws. Mm -hmm. That's what Comedy of Errors is about. Mm -hmm. And there's wackiness all throughout. And we're leaning into the wackiness. And, and mm -hmm. that's why I felt like we can hang on to this story. Yeah. We can hang on to the structure. We're, we have a, um, the, the, the text is mostly in English. We're keeping a lot of the Shakespeare's text. Very edited, but keeping a lot of the, the situations. And then started to use songs as a way to change uh, perspectives mm. and we were like eh, not into that perspective anymore or mm. as a way to uh to expand on characters mm -hmm. and to yeah. give us an, an insight into a character that maybe was not given a lot of attention to or not given a lot of depth to but trying to give a little bit of backstory of like what is the emotional underpinning for these also it's a wacky good time yeah so um but then at the end it's really about, for me, what does it mean to reconcile after being separated for so long? Mm. And it doesn't, always, it doesn't always have a happy ending. And so those were like really big questions that we, we started out with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so well put. Um, I would, one thing about the last question also that's very interesting is that my first mobile unit experience was as a musician uh such a ranger for um a it, it never became a full production but we did readings of pablo neruda's romian translation of romeo and juliet mm, um yeah. and we and that was my experience with mobile unit and stephanie brought me along for that um and it, it was jerry ruiz was directing it and it was just this incredible way and like i realized that when you see just bringing in like because language and this is something i've always thought of is you know language has borders and and just like in in our society you know borders are, are porous right and and so it really is a matter of like really opening that up and like the second you open up and you do a show in spanish suddenly in the middle of jackson heights it, it communicates in a different way especially when you feel like like Spanish has been put into a specific kind of place within our society and our culture, um, which is, you know, and so I, that, that was the fact that like, you know, Rebecca came to me and she was like, I want to do Shakespeare. I want to do it accessible. I want to make it a musical. I want to make it in Spanish. I was like, all of these things are just <laughs> making me so happy. All of those things are making me so happy. Um, and I think that, you know, this idea of, of of street theater, you know, when I think about, you know, there's I was talking about Teatro Independiente before in Argentina, but there's also, you know, a and throughout Latin America, but I'm sort of speaking from my own experience. Um, there's also a tradition of community theater, and because we don't have tons of musicals in Buenos Aires in the way that you know America, America does in, in, in that specific way, uh, but we do have so much folk music and and just the music is part of communities especially um you know it, it becomes a part of a community it becomes a part of a community event it becomes a part of a family event um and it is a connection to to the community so when you have these community theaters you know i'm thinking of in particular in la boca where you show up and like before you go into the theater there's a whole mess of food that the members of the community have like cooked for us and like we you know we we eat some food we chat we go into a, see a show and the show is like a musical review so there's a story and it's a story about the entire history of of this particular part of Argentina and then you know through one soccer club and then it just goes through music and music becomes the thread that sort of weaves it all together and I think that there's something so powerful about not just music but but folk music music that is that you know that is not again not siloed off right um you know when we think of musical theater and this has been sort of a, a larger conversation i've been having with myself about like what do we call musical theater or do we not call musical theater um and just trying to bring in other sounds and bring in more dance you know bring in cumbias bring in 
um, boleros and have them just be part of, of that conversation. You know, I, and so, you know, when we created this, when I was creating sort of the musical score of the piece, so much of it for me, wasn't it like, I want to do this one style of music. It's like, I want to bring in the music that like I grew up hearing and the music that then I also taught on Russians, you know, I used to teach a mariachi, little mariachi group in, in, in Harlem. And I'm like, I'm going to bring some mariachi music as well. And I'm going to bring the sounds that I've been hearing um, from my community um, to sort of create a tapestry of music that isn't the kind of thing. Again, when we think of musicals and we think of a certain kind of musical, you know, and thankfully that's changing and we're, we're seeing more and more examples of hip hop and, and, you know, some Latin styles in music and all of that. Um, but yeah, it's just, an, you know, the same way that we're using Spanish, the same way that we're doing that. And to then to bring Shakespeare along, <laughs> it's a way of saying, no, Shakespeare belongs to all of us, right? Like there's entire traditions of theater that like take Shakespeare and do what they they want with him. You know, I was just in I was just in Buenos Aires and they were doing a, a version of the Scottish play with one actor and he had adapted the whole thing, right? It's like it's in Spanish. It's obviously not going to be, you know, an iambic pentameter. <laughs> so um, so part of that is yeah, how how can we take these stories that are now centuries of years old that have, you know, so usually lived in certain kinds of institutions and make them um, part of our culture and our story as well. We can't just yes, show up in English. Right. Um, mm-hmm. We can't show up as a monolith at all. That's we right. have to actually represent the folks that are going that we're going to be engaging with. Right. And so, our upcoming show, Comedy of Errors, is a mm. bilingual musical adaptation mm. of uh, of the Comedy of Errors, which is was is great. Here's more from my conversation with Precious. And I rejoined the public, but by the end of Summer of Joy, there was um, positions that were open in the mobile yeah. unit. And so I advocated for myself once again, and I um, mm. got the associate director role. Um, and I served in that for a while, too, under the, under the leadership of Roxana Barrios, mm-hmm. um, who is also an amazing, mm-hmm. fierce, fierce theater maker. Theater maker and someone who was with Mobile Unit for a very for long, a very time. very long yeah. time, like yeah. upwards of more than five years. Yeah, yeah. Um, really shaped the program. Yeah. into absolutely. what it is today. Yeah. Um, and after Roxana moved on to greater things, uh, I was asked to step in as the interim director of the Mobile Unit. And so I spent the majority of my career in the Mobile Unit, but it really does align with my personal values around um, theater making and being in community. And so it's been a journey not an easy one yeah but one that's been worthwhile and and the things that I have learned during this time are just it, I could put no price to them mm. what I what I also hear so th- thank you for that mm-hmm. what I also hear is you sharing a couple of mo- mo- moments where you said hi I'm here I'm doing this this work we need to we need to make it something else Mm -hmm. and elevate it Mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that i think as a as as a black black woman as a as a black person in this industry the ability to say i'm doing something that should be acknowledged you're not seeing it is something that a, a lot of us have to deal with and mm-hmm. there's a lot of anxiety that goes with mm-hmm. raising your your hand mm-hmm. particularly in a predominantly white in- institu- mm-hmm. to- institution so can you shed a little bit of light on that journey that you yeah made? I think for me I know statistically black women don't get the same amount of money opportunities right. et cetera et cetera et cetera right. as all of our counterparts. Right. Um, and I've learned that if you don't advocate for yourself, then no one else will. Mm-hmm. And if you wait for other people to advocate for you, you may not get it when you want it. And so although mm-hmm. none of those times where I had to advocate myself for myself was easy, I also knew that it was necessary because we work in an industry where <laughs> folks are going to 
we're it's a collaborative industry, right? Mm-hmm. So the beautiful thing about theater is that no one has a no one's been a production manager their whole life. No right. one's been right. an actor their whole right. life. Like we there's ebb and flow of the amount of work that we do. I started off in stage management and then I went to production management. Yeah. And then yeah. I found my way into this producing, you know, life. But I wasn't that's I right. didn't begin there. Yes. And yes. so um for with that, I just knew that I had the skills and I had the tools and the shape of my job descriptions were changing. And with that, that needs to be acknowledged. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm also just like someone who's like, you're going to value me <laughs> because I, I know that I'm you. valuable. Yes, you, um, you, you are. And you. you are always somebody who who will support people. I think yes. you, you know, you're also very active just within the black community at the public yes. with, within the staff being someone who can be a resource or the Black History Month committee Mm -hmm. in whatever shape or form you use your marketing you use all those skills everywhere and so being your 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 colleague is also a a black a a black blessing because you know you just get to enjoy your your light and that uh come Rather, rather, too. So I appreciate you as well. I appreciate you, Carolina, <laughs> so much. <laughs> but yeah, it was really it's it's really been about keeping our relationships, our community partnerships strong, mm-hmm. so that they understand that us not being able to perform for a year and a half, it's not personal. It's we're just adjusting, yeah. and that in itself, being like, I don't have any programmings to, I don't have any programming to give you right now, mm. but. The minute that we can come back, we're gonna do it. We're you know, like yeah. that. That in itself is could be its own job. Mm-hmm. Um, Which also goes back to that conversation that we were having about just keeping those mm-hmm. lines of communication open, yeah. right? If if we are able to say to, to our community partners, "We're here. We just don't have anything because." we're having a, t- a tough time too mm-hmm. but when we do we're here for you but mm-hmm. hi, but hi are you okay right. right and 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 uh, connecting with people as h- humans yes. and not as we're going to give something to you so we can right. say look what we've done exactly. for the community right and and it's very clear that, that that's that that's not the way that you operate and it doesn't mm-hmm. and it really isn't the way that I have known m- mobile unit to operate at all at all mm-hmm. like ever since I've known of mobile it's been this really b- beautiful exchange which I I think really appreciate and and then around Shakespeare yes. which is really <laughs> cool too and 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 not um and and something that reaches out to the community community in a new w- way absolutely yeah yeah so so we keep Paul uh, Paul Pull, pull, pulling on this on this thread, and it's fair to say that the t- t- target audience um, for the mobile isn't the same as for the rest of of the of the programming at the at the public, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, it's not the same. <laughs> no, so, not at all, right? So, can we talk a little bit more about that of the difference in the in the t- target audience, um, the effects or the or the changes, how that affects or or ch- changes the the work and does it also affect the show selection as 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 well well definitely yeah. um mobile tier tends to steer away from like the tragedies <laughs> yes we live in new york city tragedies happen every day right <clears throat> not everyone wants to show up to their local rec center and see a tragedy right <laughs> So yeah. we definitely like to focus on joy, especially at the pandemic. Mm. We like to focus on comedies and joy and things that are going to make people yeah. laugh. Yeah. Um, I think to your question, what's important to bring up now is the way in which we set up the mobile unit, mm. which is we bring a carpet that's about 15 feet by 15 feet. We put audience on all four sides. Mm. You know, when you typically go to the theater, it's like, you need to turn off your cell phone. And, like, when someone's phone goes off, everybody, like, turns their head and, like, looks at the person like they have committed a cardinal sin. We say, you can take pictures, just don't take videos. I think um, 
Mm-hmm. We've also had people take full-on phone calls during our performances. <laughs> hey. We have people who yell at the characters mm-hmm. on the stage mm-hmm. when they do something they don't like, mm-hmm. right? Like the way that we show up is with the mindset that we're not going to be sitting in a quiet theater with our hands folded and our yeah exactly right we're not gonna be like this and be like oh this is the best Shakespeare I've ever seen (laughs) like no we're looking for engagement we actually prep like our cast to be prepared prepare for people to be like "Uh uh-uh no you didn't (laughs) right right (laughs) you better get them (laughs) right right, right, and those are the things that make it special and so I think we we also bring a show that's cut we don't do the four-hour Shakespeare we bring a cut script that's no more than 90 minutes Mm. because no one wants to sit through a four-hour Shakespeare anymore, if I'm just being honest. I don't. I personally don't want to sit through a four-hour Shakespeare. Let me not speak for no one. I don't. Um, and so, I, you know, some of the ways in which the the actual program is set up, and yeah. shout out to 10,000 Things for creating that model for Barry Edelstein and Oscar Eustace mm. to take and adapt specifically for the mobile unit. Yeah. But that those set parameters mm-hmm. that we set up around the way we're showing up is, is what helps us cater to the time target audience, which is regular New Yorkers. That's it. Who don't want to pay $90 to go see a show on Broadway. Right. But still want to see some theater. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm. Um, so some of what you're saying sounds really some similar to shifts that we're seeing in theater, like with Dominique more more so and 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 her rules of engagement that was that was something that sort of just like popped into into my head I was like oh yeah that's that sounds just just like that and I know Erica Dickerson Dispenza has something similar that that she also says to people in getting it gauging with with her her where where work and I'm and I'm curious from you what what the important importance is to just meet people where they are um, and and how important it is to take this art form off of its a pedestal and just say we're 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 he- here enjoy the show Yes. For me, it's about exposure. Mm. And exposure, there there is an art form that you don't necessarily have to get a formal education to that can be a conduit for transformation, mm-hmm. whether it be being an actor or actress and actually transforming into a character mm. or whether it be seeing a story, seeing your story mm. on the stage. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think about those rules of engagement. And I love the first time that I saw Colored Wada. And, you know, the note was, if you feel compelled to say, mm-hmm, clap your hands, scream, do it. And I was like, oh, this is so freeing yeah. to actually, <laughs> it actually reminds me of the Globe, <laughs> like mm. back, back in the day, mm. where, you know, Shakespeare shows were not silent. No. No. They were yelling uh, yeah. if they didn't like what was happening mm-hmm. on the stage. Mm-hmm. I don't know what happened <laughs> between that and now where it's mm-hmm. like you have to be like shush and be quiet, you know, yeah. exactly. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's about it's about that exposure and it's also about giving people the ability to react the way that they want mm-hmm. to and and feel no shame or out of place that because they're having a freedom. visceral reaction, yeah. yes, to what they're seeing on the stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm wondering then, especially in light of of some of the things that we were talking about earlier and the way that terms like community get thrown around and, as you said, have all, have, all, have, have almost become token jar, jar, jargon, how do you enter into a new community? Immunity, and how do you lead a team into a new a na- a neighborhood and introduce the mobile unit to a, n- a new new audience? And then, what l- lessons can we all learn about how to create sustainable community partnerships that are that are more than just a, a drive a drive drive by? Yes, I'm going to take the first part of that question, yes, and you might have to repeat the second <laughs> sure, part. Sure, sure. So. When I show up in a new community, the first thing that I tell everybody is that we are guests in this place. 
We are guests. So think about how you would feel if you were throwing a house party (laughs) and a guest came in (laughs) and said, I don't know why you put this paper plate out because that's not even in the direct, the, you know, in alignment with the party theme. That's not going to feel good. You are immediately going to be like, hold up now. Wait a minute. This is my house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the first thing is to recognize that you're a guest when you come into these mm-hmm. spaces. Um, and then it's about also being humble and it's about being open and know that someone may come up to you and have a full story and you may not know them from Adam, mm-hmm. but you don't show up with defensiveness. You don't show up and try to push them away. You try to gauge how, how excited they are and match their energy. Mm-hmm. Now, if you feel like you're threatened, that's a different situation. But if it's just someone coming up to you saying, oh my gosh, I love that performance. It reminded me of my grandpa when he did this, this, this. You need to engage in that. You need to, people, you need to make people feel like they belong in this space because they do. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is that we are the guests. So we technically don't mm. belong, right. quote unquote, in these right. spaces. Right. Um, and so that, I usually, I usually try to lead with that and really get that in folks' head. Like when you're stepping into this, we actually need to take the form of the community in Mm -hmm. which we're showing up in Mm -hmm. and not show up in the form that we assume they want us to. Right. Because they're not looking for what they think that we want to show up as. They want us to show up so that they feel comfortable. And it's our job to make them feel comfortable so that they can actively engage in the work and experience it. Um, Yes. Now, what was the second part of your question? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, the second p- p- part was what le- lessons can we all l- learn about how to create sustainable community a p- a p- partnerships that are more and more than just a drive- drive-by? Know that you're a guest. Mm-hmm. Always be able to engage in conversation, mm-hmm. constant conversation, because community partnerships are relationships. Mm-hmm. And so you have to tend to them like you would tend to your mother's relationship. Mm-hmm. Like, be humble when you go into those spaces. Don't show up like you know better than them because mm-hmm. you understood the Shakespeare, mm-hmm. because you understand the story. Yeah, That is actually doing a disservice to yourself and the relationships you're trying to build, and it's also undermining undermining folks' brilliance. Mm. So you you can't assume. Well, I think another lesson would be don't assume. Right. Don't come in with assumptions that yeah. you're going to be unsafe in this space or that they're not going to get it. Like, that's actually not true. You have to give people as much space and as much breath to be the person that they are and to experience the work the way that they want to. Mm. Um, so, yeah. What are some other components of mobile that people may not see? We have talked talked a bit about the work in the correctional facility. Mm-hmm. So, facility. So, I'd love for you to share a, a little bit more about about that mm-hmm. program. Yeah. So, we definitely have our public performance sites. Um, But we also do prioritize venues that are more private, like correctional facilities. Mm -hmm. And so over the past 12 years, we've partnered with at least six correctional facilities, local and state, as Mm -hmm. well as federal. Um, We've also done work with homeless shelters or shelters for the unhoused, as I like to say, um, as well. Um, And so, but that work is not We don't publicize that because it's not for public consumption, right? right? Right. It's for the folks that are going to be in that space to experience that. Um, You know, there's a lot of logistical work (laughs) that happens in mobile unit that a lot of folks don't see just because we're making theater. Um, And I I think there's an extra there's an extra sprinkle to Mm. doing that, like regular producing work, Mm. because you have to take community into account for every single one of your decisions. Mm -hmm. It's just like throughout the basis of it. Um, And so that goes into the choice of, you know, who's going to direct the piece? What piece are we choosing? How are we showing up? Are we bringing any community engagement elements? Yeah. yeah, Those those are a couple of couple of things that folks don't see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you say to encourage people to come see the m- mobile unit? When what? Why should people attend? Oh, why should people attend the mobile <laughs> unit? Because we're awesome. What do you mean? Um, no, I think people should attend the mobile unit because it's a special experience. You know, if you are used to seeing Shakespeare and having to, you know, sit quietly and really pontificate on what's going on. 
<laughs> you know, like that's not the mobile unit. We're going to show up. We're going to have songs. We're going to have dancing. Afterward, you get to talk to people immediately. You know, <laughs> you get to put down chairs with us if you want to. You know, we really try to bring people into the experience. And so it's, it's hands on. It's very intimate because you will be in the round. So you're going to see the sweat on the actor's forehead. <laughs> 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 um, yes, you will. And, you know, I also think specifically for the show that we have coming up, like, it being, I don't know if, and maybe this is because I need to brush up on my public theater history. I don't remember the last time that Mobile Unit did a bilingual production. Yeah. Right. And that in itself, mm -hmm. I think is going to be so resonant on the streets of New York. That's it for this week's episode. If you're enjoying this season of Public Square 2.0, we hope you'll remember to like, subscribe, and give us that five-star rating you know we deserve. And don't forget to check us out on Tuesdays as we re-release The Clearing, a limited series highlighting the play Shadowlands by Erica Dickerson Dispenza. Next time on Public Square 2.0, we get to do a deep dive on a show we hope you've already heard about. Fat Ham open on Broadway on April 12th, 2023. You've probably seen it featured on CBS News or in the New York Times. But long before its premiere at the American Airlines Theater, Fat Ham was a co-production at The Public with National Black Theater. We get a chance to sit down with some of the artists responsible for this amazing new work and you take a peek behind the scenes at the development process. For everyone here on the Public Square team, I'm Garlia Cornelia Jones, and we'll see you next time, Thursdays, at the Public Square. Welcome home to the Public Square. We're so glad to have you back. Today's episode of Public Square 2.0 was hosted and produced by Garlia Cornelia Jones, Director of Innovation and New Media at the Public Theater with support from new media associate Emily White. Creative production includes story support by John Sloan III of Ghost Light Creative Productions and audio production by Justin K. Sloan of Ghost Light Creative Productions. Special thanks to Freedom Bradley Ballantyne, Precious Wilson Gay, Rebecca Martinez, and Julian Messery. For a full list of credits, please visit our website, publictheater.org, for the show notes. <laughs>